Good day, and I give you the joy of it. I am David Wooster. Now, Wooster may be a name that is familiar to you. You have Wooster Mountain, Wooster Hollow, Wooster Heights. The Wooster name is found on parks, schools, shooting ranges, street signs, town squares, cemeteries, monuments, memorials, and so I'm told, something called a diner? Nonetheless, towns across the country bear my name. My death here in Danbury in 1777 is only part of the reason why. Now, I was born in Stratford in 1711, the youngest of nine children of Captain Abraham and Mary Wooster, of which three of my siblings had predeceased my birth. I entered Yale College in 1735 and graduated three years later. Seven years after that, I married Mary Clapp, daughter of Yale President Thomas Clapp. We had four children, and our son Thomas also fought in the War for Independence. During the 1700s, England and France were major powers, and Spain, although in decline, was still a force to be reckoned with. Among the three, several wars were fought prior to the Revolution. They inevitably spilled over to this side of the Atlantic. My first military experience came in 1739 during an Anglo-Spanish War. I was appointed a lieutenant in the colonial militia, although I saw no action. In 1741, there was a fear of a Spanish invasion, and I was named lieutenant of the first Connecticut Costa Garda Coast Guard vessel named Defense, and later I was promoted to captain. Then came 1744 and King George's War between England and France, part of the larger war of the War of the Austrian Succession. Here in America, Connecticut troops were included in a planned siege of Fortress Lewisburg in Nova Scotia. Fortress Lewisburg was a massive French fortification, the largest ever built in North America and a base for French privateers, basically government licensed pirates authorized to attack enemy ships. They'd been attacking English ships and taking those prizes of war and their prisoners back to Lewisburg. And the French were allied with anti-English native tribes who attacked our frontier farms and posts. They were terrifying and bloody encounters. Many civilians were killed or taken prisoner to be taken to the French and turned in for bounties. Folks were rightly afraid. So a Lewisburg invasion was planned. Soldiers from Connecticut and Massachusetts, including its main province, were mustered and put aboard ships for the nearly thousand mile trip to Nova Scotia. Imagine my pleasant surprise to find that my regiment and I were being transported aboard my old command, Defense, but this time I was merely a passenger. We landed our forces and put the fort under siege. We were preparing to attack when their commander surrendered. As I spoke French, I was made part of the escort assigned to accompany French officers, prisoners of war, back to France. From there, I went to England, where I was given an audience with King George II. I was so awestruck, I can hardly remember what we talked about. He was, after all, my monarch. As if that wasn't honor enough, I was promoted to captain in the British Army, a rare honor for a colonial. Then came the French and Indian War. I was promoted to colonel and given command of the 3rd Connecticut Regiment. The 3rd was part of a disastrous assault against the French near Fort Ticonderoga, although it was then a French fort called Fort Carillon. No ships to take us this time. It was a march of over 250 miles over wilderness roads through woods and swamps. Now, I wasn't of high enough command to be in on the planning, but our commander, General Abercrombie, didn't plan well, and our attack did not come off as planned. It was ragged and uncoordinated. As a result, we took quite a drubbing, to say the least, even though we had many more men than the French. We took heavy losses, some 2,000 souls lost out of 16,000. But we took the fort the following year and renamed it Fort Ticonderoga, and it remained a British fort until captured by Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold 16 years later. 
For a while, we had relative peace. Then our problems with King George III and his parliament began to cause unrest here in the colonies. Eventually, things came to a head. I was in charge of the New Haven militia when the shooting started in Massachusetts. A couple of days after Lexington and Concord, I was meeting with the town fathers of New Haven at Beers Tavern when Benedict Arnold and his newly formed company of Governor's Foot Guard demanded the keys to the powder magazine on New Haven Green. They planned to take powder and flints to Boston for our makeshift army and rebellion. Now, at first the town fathers were reluctant, but Arnold was adamant and very persuasive and was allowed to take what was needed. The regiment departed for Boston and, well, you know the rest. I was commissioned a major general when the Continental Army was created, and our troops joined Generals Schuyler and Montgomery in the invasion of Canada. Again, we marched over 350 miles through conditions similar to the Ticonderoga expedition. We took part in the successful siege of Fort St. John's outside of Montreal, which was taken from the Crown forces. Unfortunately, the New Year's Eve 1775 battle for Quebec was a disaster. It took place in a blinding snowstorm, though at first it looked as if it might succeed. But then Montgomery was killed and Arnold was wounded and the attack fell apart. Still, the British did soon evacuate the city. I was made military commander of Montreal. Things were fine until I took a number of steps that did not sit well with the local population. I arrested a number of professed loyalists and those who spoke ill of our American cause. Then there were certain groups who I considered dangerous and had disarmed. Also, I demanded that Montreal militia officers give up their crown commissions. Finally, the locals also didn't like it that we Americans were paying for goods and services with paper money instead of hard currency. The people of Montreal complained to my superiors about those policies I had implemented. As a result of those complaints, I was accused of all things incompetence. Now in my time, perhaps more so than today, matters of honor, dignity, integrity, and reputation were of extreme importance, especially among military men. I demanded a court-martial to clear my name, and I was quickly exonerated of all charges. I was next put in charge of Quebec for a short while before being relieved, as intended, by General Arnold. However, when our troops were forced to withdraw back into New York, I was made the scapegoat for policies implemented by my predecessors. As a result, I was cast aside from serving in the Continental Army. And so I returned home and took overall command of Connecticut's provincial militia as the state's first major general. Now we come to my least favorite subject, the 1777 British raid on Danbury and the Battle of Ridgefield, because it means we're approaching the end of my story and the end of me. General Washington had established a substantial military supply depot in Danbury that operated so successfully that the British decided it must be destroyed. April 25th, 1777, British General Tryon landed some 2,000 troops at Campo Beach in Westport, and 24 hours later forced their way into the lightly guarded town. The few defenders, militia and regulars, were easily pushed aside, and the British put the torch to tons of material, foodstuffs, tents, shoes, and other clothing destroyed. They set fire to any building from which they were fired upon. Some unfortunate patriots were trapped in burning buildings after shooting at the invaders. During their orgy of destruction, some of the Redcoats found barrels of rum and whiskey among the supplies and set about trying to drink Danbury dry. Some of them became too inebriated to function. Ward reached me in my hometown in the, of Word reached me at my home in New Haven. I alerted General Arnold, who also happened to be in town. We gathered our respective forces and headed toward Danbury by separate routes. Meanwhile, Tryon had to effect his withdrawal from Danbury. His way to the Hudson was blocked by troops of the New York militia under Colonel Ludington. His only escape was back to his ships at Campo Beach on Long Island Sound. 
Arnold arrived on the scene and took up a strong position in Ridgefield between Tryon and his escape back to his ships down on the coast. Meanwhile, I took a force and circled around to Tryon's rear to give him a hot farewell. Our first attack caught their rear guard having tea. We hit them good and off they ran. We retired to a wooded area and regrouped our men for a second go at them about an hour later. Second time, they were ready for us with a solid line of muskets and six cannons. The firing was hot with the boom of cannons, volleys of muskets emitting dense clouds of smoke, and the air was rent by the zip of passing musket balls. My horse was shot out from under me. A second was found and I remounted to continue directing my troops. Then the British cannons fired once again, one of which fired the ball that caused my mortal wound. I was taken to the Dibble House here in Danbury and died there five days later, May 2nd, 1777, and my passing was not a gentle one. My final words were, I am dying, but with a strong hope and persuasion that my country will gain her independence. Although my reputation had at times been maligned, my courage, and military ability has at last been recognized for its true worth. My reputation has begun to be restored by modern day historians with a better, less jaundiced view of history. Monuments and memorials have been erected in my honor. I close by asking this of each of you. Please remember you live in a place where history happened, part of the struggle by which our country was born. Thank you for your time and attention.